Let's open our Bibles today to Hebrews chapter 2. I want to read from um, the writer of Hebrews here who has such a, a keen insight into uh, what Jesus accomplished. Since this is Easter Sunday, normally what you do is you preach on, you know, the empty grave and what has happened there. What I'd like to do today is look at exactly what Jesus uh, conquered uh, in his resurrection, and that's what that was death itself. And I just want to look at that aspect, you know, not that he just arose, but what he conquered on our behalf. Can you say amen to that? Okay, let's pray. Father, we just thank you uh, for your amazing word that reveals so much to us of your great love, your great power, and your great victory. And I pray, Lord, that you would just open our eyes and open our ears, Lord God, to these great truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 2, let's pick it up at verse 10. It says, For it was fitting for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. God is not ashamed of you. Say that. God is not ashamed. You may be ashamed. He's not. Verse 12 saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Now, check this out. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Where is Jesus? He's here. And he worships the Father through us. Can you imagine that? It's not that we just want to worship the Lord. He wants to worship the Father as well. Is that great? And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Here he's highlighting the fact that when Jesus came, he wanted to destroy and defeat the greatest enemy of mankind, which is death itself. If you've been alive at any time, if you've been aware of people around you who have passed away, you understand the power of death and the pain that it causes. And Jesus looks down through the corridors of time and says, I'm going to take care of that problem. I'm going to be the answer for every loss in your life. I am the one who's going to flip what the enemy has done with my resurrection. He became flesh and blood like you and me to completely identify with us and also died like us so that he could have the victory and to give us the victory over death as well. It says here, that he had rendered the power of of Satan null and void, meaning that there was something happening in in the universe at the fall of mankind when Satan was given the power over mankind and sin and death. It was amazing. When he came to Adam and Eve and tempted them, he took the authority that they had. It wasn't God's plan in the beginning that anybody should die. There was a tree of life in the garden. And yet Satan came along and said, I want to show you another tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And part of that evil was death itself. And yet he deceived mankind saying, if you eat of that tree, you'll never die. And guess what happened? That's when death came into the universe. Jesus came along and said, he came back to take the keys of death and hell away from him. So I believe after he died, he went to hell and grabbed those keys back and now has given those keys to us, the church, and saying nobody has to fear death anymore because he lives, we live also, and we'll never die if we keep believing in him. Death was so rattled by the resurrection. Here is a little portion of scripture. Every time I read it, It's not really uh, elaborated on by anybody else, but go to Matthew 27. I want you to see this because I would have loved to have been in Jerusalem when this took place. This, to me, is one of the most fascinating events in history. Matthew 27, 
Look at verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, that's all it says. But can you imagine walking down the street and seeing your Uncle Bob? What are you doing here? (laughs) It says, many. Can you imagine the people coming home? You know who I saw today? I was going to the market, and Aunt Jenny came walking around the corner and was talking. I mean, this must have been amazing. But see, death was so rattled by the resurrection that his resurrection power translated to other saints that were already dead, and they jumped out of the room. How they did it, I have no idea. I mean, when I was in Israel in January, I mean, I actually saw these stones that they rolled in front of tombs. I mean, it was, there were no light things. There was no doors. This wasn't like a mausoleum that you could just open up. These were huge stones. So I got to believe angels were running around Jerusalem, rolling away stones so that the saints of God could be walking around, so that everybody knew that the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened. It wasn't just the testimony of the disciples saying, yes, we've seen him. Or if Mary Magdalene said, he's alive. We were at the tomb this morning and the angel said, he's not here, he's alive. The whole town must have been aware that something powerful happened and something in the universe was shook to its very roots and that was death itself. That God came along and said, I'm putting an end to the curse of death in the human race. And I'm saying that the resurrection power is available to all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Do you notice how both Jesus and Satan make the same promise to mankind? How do you do that, Pastor? Well, let me tell you. Glad you asked. (laughs) They both said... You won't die. Didn't they say that? In the garden, Satan says to Adam and Eve, you shall not die. Jesus comes along and says, he who believes in me will never die. Who are you going to believe? Notice the same, the same promise. It's interesting. They both make the same promise. One's a deceiver, one's a liar, one's the father of lives, and one is God himself. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to trust? See, every time the enemy comes along, he always has an agenda. And it says in John 10.10, he comes to lie, to kill, and destroy. He comes to lie or steal and destroy. This is who he is. He's the great deceiver. And he's still trying to tell people that today. The lie comes repackaged in this day and age. And he repackages the lie that you will never die in what they call universalism. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. But it basically says, you can live any way you want and we're all going to heaven. That's universalism. We're all going up. I mean, God couldn't send anybody to hell. He just repackages the lie that you will never die. In another form. And you have to reject that as well and say, no, there is only one passport to eternal life and his name is Jesus. And he extends that invitation to everybody. It's as if Jesus sent everybody in the human race an ATM card and said, here it is, eternal life. All you have to do is activate it with your faith. That's all you have to do. He's not sending anybody to hell. You choose that path. You choose eternal life through Jesus or the lie that Satan gives you. It's your choice. What what direction do you want to go? If you understand the life of Christ where he said, I'll tell you what. It says he tasted death for all of us. He tasted death for me and you so that you would know eternal life. Thank God I'm going to live forever. 
Isn't that a great thought? You can't separate me from God's love, and you can't separate me from his life itself. And what he offers mankind right now is to say yes to him. Yes to life. Yes to the victory that he's already uh, won for us. I think it's amazing that you and I live in a world that's so obsessed with youth. Isn't it amazing? Other older cultures used to, to, used to honor the, the gray heads, the old people. I'm trying my best to keep my gray like right down around here, you know what I mean? <laughs> but we used to honor older people. Now, it's all youth-oriented, isn't it? I mean, when I was growing up in the 60s, they said, don't trust anybody over 30, if you can imagine that crazy line. Because it was like, man, it was like mankind was in pursuit for eternal life on a different plane. Mankind was after what they used to call the fountain of life. Do you remember hearing about that? Uh, the Spanish uh, conquistador Ponce de Leon, de Leon uh, had gone to Florida ostensibly. They don't, I don't know how historic this is. To look for the fountain of youth. And it appeals to men. That, that, that expression, the fountain of youth, resonates within your human heart because there's something inside of us that says death is wrong, isn't it? There's something there in the human life when you stand beside a grave, beside a loved one, and you say, there's something wrong here. And God said the same thing. There's something wrong here. And I'm going to take care of death. I'm going to take a pair of all the loss in people's lives. I'm going to show them what resurrection power is really all about. So you and I can come together on Easter Sunday and we can look at the, the grave of Jesus, but to realize, boy, it's more than just him raising from the dead. It's him conquering death itself. Your death, my death, everyone's death. He basically said, I will taste death for everyone so you could all taste life in me. It's called good news, church. There's an old expression I used to like. It was that if you are born once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll die once. Anybody ever familiar with that whole thing? You know what it means? Anybody? <laughs> it means this. If you're only born once in the natural, then you will die a normal natural death and that the Bible calls going to hell the second death. So there's two deaths. There's the natural death and then there's spiritual death. But if you're born twice, meaning in the natural and then you're born again in the spirit, You'll just die once and then move on to eternal life. So what pathway do you want to go? Which do you want to choose? I'll do the double birth myself. See, once I heard that, I thought, what am I, crazy? And yet I couldn't understand why there was such reluctance in my heart to say yes to Jesus because I didn't even know what I was holding on to. But the enemy kept saying, you're going to lose something. You're going to lose something. You're going to lose something. Now I know what I lost. I lost sin. I lost Satan. <laughs> and all the other toxic things that he was selling. And I embraced eternal life. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. And let's look at verse 25 and 26. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Can you imagine? There's going to be a time where there's no death. The last enemy will be defeated. See, this is the final picture of of what God's plan is for all of mankind. I'm going to put an end to death. Go to Revelations chapter 21. You see this final outcome spelled out here. In verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. 
and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death come on. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have come to pass. He's putting an end to it, church. When people want to accuse God to you or Satan wants to accuse God to your mind, you've got to understand his overall plan. All the tears that have been shed throughout the centuries, all the pain, all the suffering, all the loss. God, why did this happen? Why did I lose this person? Why so soon? Why so tragic? He's basically saying, look, I'm going to put an end to this. Trust me, I'm putting an end to all of this, and I will wipe away every tear from your eye. Because I was with you in all of those losses. Because I tasted death for everybody. And I know what that pain is. When Jesus was at Lazarus' tomb, it says he wept. And people have given different, you know, things. He was weeping over their unbelief. Now, I really believe he wept. Because Lazarus was one of his best friends. And he tasted death for everybody. And he knew the pain of death and the pain of loss. So he can say as, as, as a real comforter, as a real friend, I'm putting an end to this. And I will wipe away all the tears from your eyes. The losses that you had. Me, when I was growing up, when I lost my brother, I've told this story many times. It was, I didn't know where to put that. And I realized one day, I, I, I'll never forget this. I found an old box in my parents' house. And there was letters that my brother had written to my parents. I never knew he did this. And he wrote in this letter to my mother and dad. He said, today, mom and dad, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I just broke out crying. Because I knew now where he was. I was like, you know, I was, you know, we didn't know. I was 12, he was 11, what was going on. And I read that. I thought, oh, yes. I'm going to see Dennis again. <laughs> and I felt like... The Lord was saying, Tim, I've taken care of all the pain. It was a big deal in your heart, but I was there way ahead of you to bring comfort to your wounded heart and letting you know that you're going to see him again. And that will be a great day. And you'll see your loved ones again because why? He conquered death. That's what he did for us. And he is your best friend and your greatest ally. And it says he's not ashamed to call you, brethren. You may be ashamed of what you're going through. He's not. He understands the battles you're going through. He understands the struggle. He knows the power of sin and death. He understands. He knows. And said, guess what? I've crushed it for you. I've gone ahead of you. And I fought that fight for you. I've wrestled the enemy. And I've pinned him down and stole the keys. And the power of sin has been broken. And the power of death is broken. And the power of Satan has been broken. Because he grabbed the keys and he ran and gave them to you and me. And said, if you will grab these keys from me, I will set you free from all of that stuff. All of the confusion, all of the pain, all of the darkness, all of the fears, all the shames in your life. I grab those keys from the enemy and I want to hand them to you to set you free. And that's what he said his mission statement was in Luke 4. I've come to heal broken hearts, to set captives free, to set loose those who are bound, those who are struggling with anything. I've got the keys. Say it. He has the keys. It's not in you. It's in him. You just turn your life to him and say, Lord, you give me the key to get out of this mess. You give me the key to get out of this darkness, this dungeon. Guess what? He's already got the keys for you. All you have to do is approach him and say, Lord, you've won this victory for me. And I love the way it ends in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. As we celebrate Easter Day, just know that there's victory for you in every area in your life. Every area. I don't care what the enemy's throwing at you. I don't care what the struggle is. There is victory for every area in your life. Don't listen to the enemy that he doesn't care that he doesn't have a plan, that he doesn't have a purpose, that he doesn't have a strategy for you, because he has won this battle for you so that you could live not only in victory here and now, but in eternal life with him in glory. Is that a good plan? Is he not a good God? Is he not a great Savior? 
<laughs> That's who he is. And when I see him always in that light, and I don't let the enemy's lies cloud the, uh, his face, and I keep looking at him and say, Lord, you're still the answer. I may not have figured it out today, but I will figure it out. I know that being allied with him is the answer for the human race. Jesus has come and said to everybody, man, woman, children, just put your life in my hands. Let me be your ally in the struggles and in the challenges of your life. Why do life without God? Is that amazing? Who would choose to have the ruler of the universe and say, we're just going to use you as like a fire alarm? You know, we're going to get a hold of you only in, in, in times of desperation. Need Instead of saying, no, I can walk with him day in and day out and have his fellowship, his wisdom, his power, his very life itself for every challenge that I have. Why not have God as your ally? Why not have the Savior of the world your Savior? Why not take his victory as your victory? And say, say, no, I think I'm doing okay. (laughs) When you can have God himself. Easter is about God stepping into mankind's life. And saying, I'm going to taste everything that you struggle with. Everything you are struggling with. And I'm going to let it invade my body. So you can have the victory in your body. Not only that, it says when, when, when we finally go to glory, we're going to have a resurrected body as well. I can't even, I'm amazed in what that is. I mean, Jesus was walking through walls, walking on water. I mean, he just defied every natural law there was to show us what he's got in store for us. It's almost as if nature is in a minor key. So when he says, eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. I can't wait. It gets better every day, doesn't it? Yeah, like D.L. Moody said, you're going to read in the newspaper one day that D.L. Moody has died. He said, don't you believe it. (laughs) In that day, I'll be more alive than I've ever been in my whole life. (laughs) Because he lives, we live. Can you say amen? Let's stand. See, I said I'd make it short, so. (laughs) Let's pray. Father. I just thank you for your sons and your daughters here. For everyone who's here, know that you have a Savior who died just for you. If you were the only person who ever lived, he would have come and died just for you. That's how important you are. That's how special you are to him. That's why he came for you to bring you home. So that you could do life with him. That you could read his heart and his mind every day in his word. You don't need texts from friends. You just need the text of his word. And let these texts bring life and hope to every need in your life. Father, I pray to everyone here, Lord. Let them see your face as your eternal friend. Who tasted death for everyone who took on his body all of our sins and all of our sicknesses, took everything the enemy could throw at him and still rose from the dead. He grabbed the keys of death and hell and gave us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would just reach into our hearts and minds today so that you and I could say yes to him and no to Satan. Yes to him no to ourselves yes to him and to all of his promises and yes to the promise of eternal life Lord let us lift up a yes today to you in response to your great sacrifice for us and in response to the great victory that you've won for us Lord Father we do say yes say it everybody yes one two three yes one two three Yes, in Jesus' name, amen. He is risen indeed today. Oh
Hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies. Come on, start singing with me. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Weapon is a melody. Yeah. Raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. The presence of my enemies. The presence of my enemies. Praise the hallelujah Louder than the unbelief If you believe it today, lift your voice Praise the hallelujah My weapon is a melody Praise the hallelujah Heaven come to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, and the king is alive. Hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. Use your weapon. Weapon is a melody. Hey, raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, gonna hear my praises roar. From the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, and the king is. A, I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing it in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief lift your voice today I raise a hallelujah my weapon my weapon is a melody yeah 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 Praise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. One last time, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. 
there with everything inside of me with everything inside of me yeah 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 i raise a hallelujah watch the darkness flee i will watch the darkness flee Raise a hallelujah, raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery, in the middle of the mystery I'll raise a hallelujah Fear has lost its hold on me He's alive, yeah, yeah, yeah Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, blessed Savior. We just pray God's richest blessing on you and your families. We thank you for the good work that he's begun in you and he's promised to complete. So, Father, we just release everyone here in your amazing grace and for your abiding peace, Lord God. Multiply your grace and your peace to everyone here now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you need prayer, worship teams will be up here to pray for you. We believe God is great and we believe God is good.